What ho, what ho, this fellow is dancing mad. He hath been bitten by the tarantula. All in the wrong. Many years ago, I contracted an intimacy with a Mr. William Legrand. He was of an ancient Huguenot family, and had once been wealthy, but a series of misfortunes had reduced him to want. To avoid the mortification consequent upon his disasters, he left New Orleans, the city of his forefathers, and took up his residence at Sullivan's Island near Charleston, South Carolina. This island is a very singular one. It consists of little else than the sea sand, and is about three miles long. Its breadth at no point exceeds a quarter of a mile. It is separated from the mainland by a scarcely perceptible creek, oozing its way through a wilderness of reeds and slime, a favorite resort of the marsh hen. The vegetation, as might be supposed, is scant, or at least dwarfish. No trees of any magnitude are to be seen near the western extremity, where Fort Moultrie stands, and where there are some miserable frame buildings tenanted during the summer by the fugitives from Charleston's dust and fever, may be found indeed the bristly palmetto. But the whole island, with the exception of this western point, and a line of hard white beach on the seacoast, is covered with a dense undergrowth of the sweet myrtle so much prized by the horticulturists of England. The shrub here often attains the height of fifteen or twenty feet, and forms an almost impenetrable compass, burdening the air with its fragrance. In the inmost recesses of this compass, not far from the eastern or more remote end of the island, Legrand had built himself a small hut, which he occupied when I first by mere accident made his acquaintance. This soon ripened into friendship, for there was much in the recluse to excite interest and esteem. I found him well educated, with unusual powers of mind, but infected with misanthropy, and subject to perverse moods of alternate enthusiasm and melancholy. He had with him many books, but rarely employed them. His chief amusements were gunning and fishing, or sauntering along the beach and through the myrtles, in quest of shells or entomological specimens, his collection of the latter might have been envied by a swammerdam. In these excursions he was usually accompanied by an old negro called Jupiter, who had been manumitted before the reverses of the family, but who could be induced, neither by threats nor by promises, to abandon what he considered his right of attendance upon the footsteps of his young Massa Will. It is not improbable that the relatives of Legrand, conceiving him to be somewhat unsettled in intellect, had contrived to instill this obstinacy into Jupiter, with a view to the supervision and guardianship of the wanderer. The winters in the latitude of Sullivan's Island are seldom very severe, and in the fall of the year it is a rare event indeed when a fire is considered necessary. About the middle of October there occurred, however, a day of remarkable chilliness. Just before sunset, I scrambled my way through the evergreens to the hut of my friend, whom I had not visited for several weeks, my residence being at that time in Charleston, a distance of nine miles from the island, while the facilities of passage and repassage were very far behind those of the present day. Upon reaching the hut, I rapped, as was my custom, and getting no reply, sought for the key where I knew it was secreted, unlocked the door, and went in. A fine fire was blazing upon the hearth. It was a novelty, and by no means an ungrateful one. I threw off an overcoat, took an armchair by the crackling logs, and awaited patiently the arrival of my hosts. Soon after dark they arrived, and gave me a most cordial welcome. Jupiter, grinning from ear to ear, bustled about to prepare some marsh hens for supper. Legrand was in one of his fits, how else shall I term them, of enthusiasm. He had found an unknown bivalve forming a new genus, and more than this he had hunted down and secured, with Jupiter's assistance, a scarabaeus, which he believed to be totally new, but in respect to which he wished to have my opinion on the morrow. And why not tonight? I asked, rubbing my hands over the blaze and wishing the whole tribe of the Scarabii at the devil. Ah, 
If I had only known you were here, said Legrand, but it's so long since I saw you, and how could I foresee that you would pay me a visit this very night of all others? As I was coming home, I met Lieutenant Gunn from the fort, and very foolishly I lent him the bug, so it will be impossible for you to see it until the morning. Stay here tonight, and I will send Jupe down for it at sunrise. It is the loveliest thing in creation. What, sunrise? Nonsense, no, the bug. It is of a brilliant gold color, about the size of a large hickory nut, with two jet black spots near one extremity of the back, and another somewhat longer at the other. The antenna are. They ain't no tin in him, Massa Will. I keep a tellin on you, here interrupted Jupiter. De bug is a ghoul bug, solid, every bit of him, inside and out, sep him wing. Never feel half so heavy a bug in my life. Well, suppose it is, Jupe, replied Legrand, somewhat more earnestly, it seemed to me, than the case demanded. Is that any reason for your letting the birds burn? The color, here he turned to me, is really almost enough to warrant Jupiter's idea. You never saw a more brilliant metallic luster than the scales emit. But of this you cannot judge till tomorrow. In the meantime, I can give you some idea of the shape. Saying this, he seated himself at a small table on which were a pen and ink, but no paper. He looked for some in a drawer, but found none. Never mind, he said at length, this will answer, and he drew from his waistcoat pocket a scrap of what I took to be very dirty fool's cap, and made upon it a rough drawing with a pen. While he did this, I retained my seat by the fire, for I was still chilly. When the design was complete, he handed it to me without rising. As I received it, a loud growl was heard, succeeded by a scratching at the door. Jupiter opened it, and a large Newfoundland, belonging to Legrand, rushed in, leaped upon my shoulders, and loaded me with a caress, for I had shown him much attention during previous visits. When his gambols were over, I looked at the paper, and to speak the truth found myself not a little puzzled at what my friend had depicted. Well, I said, after contemplating it for some minutes, this is a strange scarabaeus, I must confess, new to me. Never saw anything like it before, unless it was a skull or a death's head, which it more nearly resembles than anything else that has come under my observation. A death's head? echoed Legrand. Oh, yes, well, it has something of that appearance upon paper, no doubt. The two upper black spots look like eyes, eh? and the longer one at the bottom like a mouth, and then the shape of the whole is oval. Perhaps so, said I, but the grand, I fear you're no artist. I must wait until I see the beetle itself, if I'm to form any idea of its personal appearance. Well, I don't know, said he, a little nettled. I draw tolerably, should do it at least, have had good masters, and flatter myself that I'm not quite a blockhead. But, my dear fellow, you're joking, then, said I, this is a very passable skull indeed i may say that it is a very excellent skull according to the vulgar notions about such specimens of physiology and your scarabaeus must be the queerest scarabaeus in the world if it resembles it why we may get up a very thrilling bit of superstition upon this hint i presume you will call the bug scarabaeus caput hominis or something of that kind there are many similar titles in the natural histories, but where are the antenna you spoke of? The antenna, said Legrand, who seemed to be getting unaccountably warm upon the subject. I'm sure you must see the antenna. I made them as distinct as they are in the original insect, and I presume that it is sufficient. Well, well, I said, perhaps you have. Still, I don't see them. And I handed him the paper without additional remark not wishing to ruffle his temper, but I was much surprised at the turn affairs had taken. His ill humor puzzled me, and as for the drawing of the beetle, there were positively no antenna visible, and the whole did bear a very close resemblance to the ordinary cuts of a death's head. He received the paper very peevishly, and was about to crumple it, apparently to throw it in the fire, when a casual glance at the design seemed suddenly to rivet his attention. In an instant his face grew violently red, in another excessively pale. 
For some minutes he continued to scrutinize the drawing minutely where he sat. At length he arose, took a candle from the table, and proceeded to seat himself upon a sea chest in the furthest corner of the room. Here again he made an anxious examination of the paper, turning it in all directions. He said nothing, however, and his conduct greatly astonished me. Yet I thought it prudent not to exacerbate the growing moodiness of his temper by any comment. Presently he took from his coat pocket a wallet, placed the paper carefully in it, and deposited both in a writing desk, which he locked. He now grew more composed in his demeanor, but his original air of enthusiasm had quite disappeared, and yet he seemed not so much sulky as abstracted. As the evening wore away, he became more and more absorbed in reverie, from which no sallies of mine could arouse him. It had been my intention to pass the night at the hut, as I had frequently done before, but seeing my host in this mood, I deemed it proper to take leave. He did not press me to remain, but as I departed, he shook my hand with even more than his usual cordiality. It was about a month after this, and during the interval I had seen nothing of Legrand, when I received a visit, at Charleston, from his man Jupiter. I had never seen the good old negro look so dispirited, and I feared that some serious disaster had befallen my friend. "'Well, Jupe,' said I, "'what is the matter now? How is your master?' "'Why, to speak the troop, massa, him not very well as mort be.' Not well, I'm truly sorry to hear it. What does he complain of? There, that's it. Him never plain o' nothin', but him very sick for all that. Very sick, Jupiter, why didn't you say so at once? Is he confined to bed? No, that he ain't. He ain't fine nowhere. That's just war de shoe pinch. My mind has got to be very heavy about poor Massa Will. Jupiter, I should like to understand what it is you're talking about. You say your master is sick. Hasn't he told you what ails him? Why, Massa, it ain't worth while for to get mad about the matter. Massa will say nothing at all ain't the matter with him. But then what make him go about looking this here way, with his head down and he soldiers up, and as white as a goose? And then he keep a siphon all the time. Keeps a what, Jupiter? Keeps a siphon with the figures on the slate. The queerest figures I ever did see. I's getting to be scared, I tell you. Have for to keep mighty tight eye upon him noovers. T'other day he give me slip, for the sun up and was gone the whole of the blessed day. I had a big stick ready cut for to give him deuce good beating when he did come. But I's such a fool that I hadn't the heart after all. He looked so very poorly. Eh? What? Ah, yes. Upon the whole, I think you had better not be too severe with the poor fellow. Don't flog him, Jupiter. He can't very well stand it. But can you form no idea of what has occasioned this illness, or rather, this change of conduct? Has anything unpleasant happened since I saw you? No, massa, they ain't been nothing unpleasant since den. Twas for den, I'm feared. Twas the very day you was there. How? How do you mean? Why, massa, I mean the bug, dare now. The, the what? The bug. I bury certain that massa will been bit somewhere about the head by that ghoul bug. And what cause have you, Jupiter, for such a supposition? Claws enough, massa, and mouth, too. I never did see such a deuced bug. He kick and he bite everything what come near him. Massa will catch him fuss, but had for to let him go gen mighty quick, I tell you. Then was the time he must a got de bite. I didn't like de look of de bug mouth myself, no how, so I wouldn't take hold of him with my finger. But I catch him with a piece of paper that I found. I wrap him up in the paper and stuff a piece of it in his mouth. That was the way. And you think then that your master was really bitten by the beetle and that the bite made him sick? I don't think nothing about it. I knows it. What make him dream about the gold so much if taint cause he bit by the gold bug? I's heard about them gold bugs for this. But how do you know he dreams about gold? How do I know? Why, cause he talk about it in his sleep. That's how I knows. Well, Jew, perhaps you're right. But to what fortunate circumstance am I to attribute the honor of a visit from you today? What the matter, Massa? Did you bring any message from Mr. Legrand? No, Massa, I bring this here pistol. 
and here Jupiter handed me a note which ran thus My dear friend why have I not seen you for so long a time? I hope you have not been so foolish as to take offense at any little brusquerie of mine But no that is improbable since I saw you I have had great cause for anxiety I have something to tell you yet scarcely know how to tell it or whether I should tell it at all I have not been quite well for some days past and poor old Jupe annoys me almost beyond endurance by his well-meant intentions Would you believe it? He had prepared a huge stick the other day with which to chastise me for giving him the slip and Spending the day solace among the hills on the mainland I verily believe that my ill looks alone saved me from a flogging I have made no addition to my cabinet since we met if you can in any way make it convenient come over with Jupiter do come I wish to see you tonight upon business of importance I assure you that it is of the highest importance ever yours William Legrand there was something in the tone of this note which gave me great uneasiness its whole style differed materially from that of Legrand. What could he be dreaming of? What new crotchet possessed his excitable brain? What business of the highest importance could he possibly have to transact? Jupiter's account of him boded no good. I dreaded lest the continued pressure of misfortune had at length fairly unsettled the reason of my friend. Without a moment's hesitation, therefore, I prepared to accompany the Negro upon reaching the wharf. I noticed a scythe and three spades all apparently new Lying in the bottom of the boat in which we were to embark What is the meaning of all this Jupe? I inquired him scythe massa and spade Very true, but what are they doing here? Him de scythe and de spade what massa will sis pon my buying for him in de town and de devil's own lot of money I had to give for him but what in the name of all that is mysterious is your massa will going to do with scythes and spades? That's more than I know and devil take me if I don't believe tis more than he know too But it's all come of the bug Finding that no satisfaction was to be obtained of Jupiter whose whole intellect seemed to be absorbed by the bug I now stepped into the boat and made sail with a fair and strong breeze we soon ran into the little cove to the northward of Port Moultrie and a walk of some two miles brought us to the hut It was about three in the afternoon when we arrived Legrand had been awaiting us in eager expectation He grasped my hand with a nervous impressment which alarmed me and strengthened the suspicions already entertained His countenance was pale even to ghastliness and his deep-set eyes glared with an unnatural luster after some inquiries respecting his health I asked him not knowing what better to say if he had yet obtained the scarabaeus from lieutenant gunn Oh, yes, he replied coloring violently. I got it from him the next morning Nothing should tempt me to part with that scarabaeus. Do you know that Jupiter is quite right about it? In what way I asked with a sad foreboding at heart in supposing it to be a bug of real gold He said this with an air of profound seriousness and I felt inexpressibly shocked This bug is to make my fortune he continued with a triumphant smile to reinstate me in my family possessions Is it any wonder then that I prize it since fortune has thought fit to bestow it upon me? I have only to use it properly and I shall arrive at the gold of which it is the index Jupiter bring me that scarabaeus What de bug massa? I'd rather not go for trouble that bug you must get him for your own self Hereupon Legrand arose and with a grave and stately air brought me the beetle from a glass case in which it was enclosed It was a beautiful scarabaeus and at that time unknown to naturalists of course a great prize in a scientific point of view there were two round black spots near one extremity of the back and a long one near the other The scales were exceedingly hard and glossy with all the appearance of burnished gold The weight of the insect was very remarkable and taking all things into consideration I could hardly blame Jupiter for his opinion respecting it But what to make of Legrand's concordance with that opinion? I could not for the life of me tell
I sent for you, said he in a grandiloquent tone. When I had completed my examination of the beetle, I sent for you that I might have your counsel and assistance in furthering the views of fate and of the frag. My dear Legrand, I cried, interrupting him, you are certainly unwell, and had better use some little precautions. You shall go to bed, and I will remain with you a few days until you get over this. You are feverish and feel my pulse, said he. I felt it, and to say the truth found not the slightest indication of fever. But you may be ill and yet have no fever. Allow me this once to prescribe for you. In the first place, go to bed. In the next, you are mistaken, he interposed. I am as well as I can expect to be under the excitement which I suffer. If you really wish me well, you will relieve this excitement. And how is this to be done? Very easily. Jupiter and myself are going upon an expedition into the hills upon the mainland, and in this expedition we shall need the aid of some person in whom we can confide. You are the only one we can trust. Whether we succeed or fail, the excitement which you now perceive in me will be equally allayed. I am anxious to oblige you in any way, I replied, but do you mean to say that this infernal beetle has any connection with your expedition into the hills? It has. Then, Legrand, I can become a party to no such absurd proceeding. I am sorry, very sorry, for we shall have to try it by ourselves. Try it by yourselves? The man is surely mad. But stay, how long do you propose to be absent? Probably all night. We shall start immediately, and be back at all events by sunrise. And will you promise me upon your honor? that when this freak of yours is over, and the bug business, good God, settled to your satisfaction, you will then return home and follow my advice implicitly, as that of your physician? Yes, I promise. And now let us be off, for we have no time to lose. With a heavy heart, I accompanied my friend. We started about four o'clock, Legrand, Jupiter, the dog, and myself. Jupiter had with him the scythe and spades, the whole of which he insisted upon carrying, more through fear, it seemed to me, of trusting either of the implements within reach of his master, than for any excessive industry or complacence. His demeanor was dogged in the extreme, and dat deuced bug were the sole words which escaped his lips during the journey. For my own part I had charge of a couple of dark lanterns, while Legrand contented himself with the scarabaeus, which he carried attached to the end of a bit of whipcord, twirling it to and fro with the air of a conjurer as he went. When I observed this last plain evidence of my friend's aberration of mind, I could scarcely refrain from tears. I thought it best, however, to humor his fancy, at least for the present, or until I could adopt some more energetic measures. In the meantime, I endeavored, but all in vain, to sound him in regard to the object of the expedition. Having succeeded in inducing me to accompany him, he seemed unwilling to hold conversation upon any topic of minor importance, and to all my questions vouchsafed no other reply than, We shall see. We crossed the creek at the head of the island by means of a skiff, and ascending the high grounds on the shore of the mainland, proceeded in a northwesterly direction through a tract of country excessively wild and desolate, where no trace of a human footstep was to be seen. Legrand led the way with decision, pausing only for an instant here and there to consult what appeared to be certain landmarks of his own contrivance upon a former occasion. In this manner we journeyed for about two hours, and the sun was just setting when we entered a region infinitely more dreary than any yet seen. It was a species of tableland, near the summit of an almost inaccessible hill, densely wooded from base to pinnacle, and interspersed with huge crags that appeared to lie loosely upon the soil, and in many cases were prevented from precipitating themselves into the valleys below merely by the support of the trees against which they reclined. Deep ravines in various directions gave an air of still sterner solemnity to the scene. 
The natural platform to which we had clambered was thickly overgrown with brambles, through which we soon discovered that it would have been impossible to force our way but for the scythe. And Jupiter, by direction of his master, proceeded to clear for us a path to the foot of an enormously tall tulip tree which stood with some eight or ten oaks upon the level and far surpassed them all and all the other trees which i had then ever seen in the beauty of its foliage and form in the wide spread of its branches and in the general majesty of its appearance when we reached this tree legrand turned to jupiter and asked him if he thought he could climb it the old man seemed a little staggered by the question and for some moments made no reply at length he approached the huge trunk walked slowly around it and examined it with minute attention when he had completed his scrutiny he merely said yes massa jupe line any tree he ever see in he life then up with you as soon as possible for it will soon be too dark to see what we are about how far must go up massa inquired jupiter get up the main trunk first and then i will tell you which way to go and here stop take this beetle with you de bug massa will de gold bug cried the negro drawing back in dismay what for must tote de bug way up de tree darn if i do if you are afraid jupe a great big negro like you to take hold of a harmless little dead beetle why you can carry it up by this string but if you do not take it up with you in some way i shall be under the necessity of breaking your head with this shovel end of section four